breaks the power of sin and darkness Who love is mighty and so much stronger The King of glory, the King above all kings Who checks the whole earth with holy thunder Who lifts us breathless in awe and wonder The King of glory the King above all kings This is amazing grace This is unveiling love That you will take my place That you will bear my cross You will let down your life Then I will be set free Jesus, I'll sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of powerful kings. Who rules nations? Who rules the nations with truth and justice Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance The King of glory, the King of powerful King This is amazing grace This is a failing love I you take my place that you bear my crown, Lord, you will let down your life, and I will be set free. Oh, this is our sin for this is amazing grace, this is a failing Lord, that you will take my place. You bear my crown, oh, you will let down your life, that I will be set free. Oh, this is how sing for all that you've done for me. What is the lamb who was slain? Worthy is the King who conquers the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquers the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy, Worthy is the King who conquers the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy, worthy, worthy this is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you will take my place That you will bear my crown You will let down your life Then I will be set free Jesus, I'll sing for this is amazing grace. This is a failing love. I will take my place. I will bear my cross. You will let down your life, and I will be set free. I'll sing for all that you've done for me Oh, Jesus, I'll sing for all that you've done for me Oh, Jesus, I'll sing for all that you've done for me Hold on.
do what is true Though I cannot see If the storms of life they've come And the road ahead gets steep I will lift these hands in faith I will believe I remind myself Love came thou and rescue me Love came thou and set me free I am yours I am forever yours Mountain high or valley low I see now and remind my soul That I am yours I am forever yours My heart is filled with hope And every promise comes my way When I feel your hands of grace Raise upon me, Lord Staying desperate for you, God Staying humble at your feet I will lift these hands in praise I will believe I will find of all that you've done And the life I've had because of your soul Love came down and rescued me Love came down and set me free I am yours, I am forever yours Mountain high I'll see now and remind my soul that I am yours, I am forever yours, yes I am yours, I am yours Lord, all my days, Jesus I am yours, I am yours Lord. I am yours, I'm yours forever. I am yours, I'm yours forever, Lord. I am yours, Lord. I am yours, Lord. For all my days, Jesus, I am yours. I am yours, Lord. I am yours, Lord. Love came down and rescue me. Love came down and set me free. I am yours. I am forever yours. Mountain high or valley low, I'll see now. Remind my soul that I am yours. I am forever yours.
Welcome back everyone and trust you've enjoyed the time of worship that we've had this morning. I've been blessed by that. Um, I want to turn now just to again to the Word of God this, this morning uh, and um, I have a, a message I'm entitled uh, Springing the Trap of the Fowl or Springing the Traps of the Enemy. And um, I've got a scripture that I want you to turn with me to. It's Psalm one, as Psalm ninety-one. Uh, Psalm ninety-one. Get your Bibles out and let's read the the word together. But before we do, let's just pray and ask God to reveal and unpack and unveil His word, the life that's in His word to us this morning. So, Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for your precious life producing, life-giving Word. I thank you, Lord, that this Word carries your breath behind it. It carries your heart and your mind. And so, Lord, as we hear it, as we receive it this morning, I pray, Lord, we'll re receive it directly from you, O oh God. Lord, will it speak to us, Lord, this morning as a a letter of love to our hearts, O oh God, and consolation, comfort, encouragement, everything we need, Lord, we pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So Psalm 91, starting at verse 1, it says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler or the bird catcher and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you in the pinions with his pinions under his wings. You will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the arrow of the night nor the arrow that flies by day, nor pestilence stalks in the darkness, nor destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High who is my refuge. No evil should be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him. Because he knows my name, when he calls to me, I will answer. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him with and, and, and honor him. And with long life will I satisfy him and show him salvation or deliverance. Praise his name. Hallelujah. God blessed us his word this morning. As I said, the, the message this morning is uh, the springing the trap that the enemy sets. You know, when we consider uh, our lives in the midst of what we're going through right now uh, in 2020, uh, many of us, you know, there's there's been times where, you know, different things have brought things to a head and many people are really in, 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 in crisis point financially and families and in health in so many ways, society is in a very, in a very precarious position. And, uh, you know, in, during these times of pressure and stress, there are often times that the enemy takes advantage. In some ways, he's firing his artillery in our direction. Uh, this could be fa aimed at your family. Uh, it could be aimed at the, at the church, the family of God. Or he will aim it at your faith, trying to undermine and uh, discourage you in your faith can be also just in the area of finance. And we know many, many people are struggling right now and will uh, face uncertain futures in terms of finances. But praise God, what we need to realize is that, uh, you know, God gives us spiritual weaponry. It's 
one of the points that we've been praying over the the course of this week second uh, Corinthians chapter 10 it says though we walk in the flesh we do not war according to the flesh okay our battle is not just limited to earthly resources hallelujah verse 4 but the weapons of our warfare are, are not carnal they're not fleshly but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds the casting down of arguments vain imaginations every high pretentious thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God and bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when our obedience is fulfilled hallelujah praise his name amen so God gives us spiritual weapons when the enemy comes in like a flood the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard he gives us his grace to empower us he gives us his word to guide us he gives us wisdom to work out the complexities of situations you are not left defenseless and these weapons that God gives us to fight off and fend off every fiery dart, every strategy and affliction that the enemy sends in our way, the Bible says are divinely powerful. They have a, a God's fingerprint upon it. Hallelujah. God's mind behind it. Praise his name. So friends, you know, for the Christian, you know, there's a reality. And the reality is, is that there are battles to fight. I mean, life is not a bed of roses. If people think it's a bed of roses, they're living at Disneyland. Amen. Uh, you know, there are difficulties to overcome. Uh, there are battles to overcome, but there's a victory sure to come. Praise God. The outcome is sure for you who are a Christian. And again, we need to be encouraged by the Word of God. Uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 37 says, Yet in all these things... Everything that you face right now, every hardship, every difficulty, it says we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Hallelujah. Praise his name. Amen. John chapter uh, uh, John chapter uh, 16. Praise God, I'll just read it here for you. And verse 33, Jesus gives his disciples a tremendous encouragement in John chapter 16 he says these things I've said to you that in me you might have peace in the world you will have tribulation but take heart I have overcome the world hallelujah you're going to experience difficulties situations afflictions attacks these are realities of life but we have someone who's gone before us, amen, who's broken the back and the power of it, and risen again, hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57, he says, but thanks, Paul said, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14 says, but thanks be to God who in Christ, in Jesus, always always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere praise god hallelujah praise god in uh, philippians chapter uh, 4 and verse 14 it tells us that we can do all things through christ who strengthens us the weapons of our warfare divinely inspired, empowered by his spirit to bring us into that victory. Hallelujah. So the enemy is losing a, 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 a battle. He's losing the battle. We are on the victory side if we continue in Christ and stay connected with him and his purposes. Praise God. And so the, 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 the psalm we've just read today, Psalm 91, really is a, is a tremendous psalm to us, a great encouragement in the midst of hardship, in the midst of difficulty. It's promise of protection from our enemy. It's a psalm of deliverance from the power of the enemy. It's a promise to, of grace to prevail and maintain victory over our difficulties and over our problems. Praise God. 
and you know, for the, the Jews as they would read this particular psalm, this is a very significant psalm for the Jewish people and for the, the people in uh, the times of Christ and still for today, praise God, and obviously for us as, as Christians. And really, Psalm 91 is a psalm of deliverance. And you see, what we're going to understand is, is for the, the Jewish mind and the way that the Bible has been written, the, the worldview that the Bible portrays is not simply a secular, natural worldview. The worldview that the Bible is written in, it contains within it both the spiritual, the emotional and the physical, the material. Amen. And all three are intricately linked. Amen. And so this particular psalm was seen and used by the Jews as a psalm of deliverance. They would actually read this psalm if they were dealing with uh, exorcism, dealing with situations which were uh, unnatural, uh, unseen. And um, we also need to be aware that, you know, we're battling against not all flesh and blood. Everything's not just material, but there is a spiritual component. There is an emotional, psychological component. There's a soul component. But then there is also the, the physical, praise God. And we address things on those three different levels, praise His name. And so for them, you know, they would see, like in verses 5 and 6, it talks about the terror uh, that stalks at night. And they, had a, they, they recognized this was actually not just, this was a, a demonic entity. They had a name for it. They called it Le Leith. Uh, it was described as the screeching owl, the night hag or the night monster, uh, the pestilence that uh, stalk walks in the darkness. They labeled that as Namtar. Uh, and um, that often brought sickness, disease, plagues, pestilence. Uh, and then there's the word destruction here. The one, and they, this was a one-eyed demon which caused a wasting disease or, or robbing, sucking the life out of people. So this was not merely just physical. This wasn't just a natural uh, experience or affliction. These had actual spiritual connotations and behind it all there was spiritual. Now we in our Western mindset find that difficult and I understand that. But could it be that ancients had more wisdom than we do? Amen. Could it be that we also need to incorporate in our worldview the fact that things are spiritual? That's why prayer is such a significant importance. Uh, praying against these things. Amen. Now that's not to discount the need for medical doctors or practical natural solutions to situations, but include the spiritual. Praise God and God will bless you. Our key verse this morning is verse 3 and it says, Surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. He's going to deliver you from the snare, the trap the enemy sets. And that's what a, a snare is. A snare is, is actually this is a bird trap. And um, uh, he's going to deliver us from that. Amen. And the central thought here of this particular verse, verse 3, he shall surely deliver you from the snare of the fowler, is the idea of one of freedom and liberty. And the picture here, the snare of the fowler, the fowler is a bird catcher. And uh, the picture here is of a released bird. Amen. A bird who's been trapped and then someone coming and freeing that bird. Amen. Psalm uh, 124 and verses 7 and 8 reflect and echo this thought. It says this, Our soul has escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we are escaped. Our help is in the name of Jehovah, the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Praise God. You know, some years ago, I, I remember uh, looking at a, um, reading a, 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 a little story about a pastor. And this pastor, uh, he was taking a walk in the park and he came across uh, a couple of young lads. And these young lads had uh, caught two sparrows. And they had those sparrows in a makeshift cage 
and uh, what they were doing was the the pastor uh, passed by them this they had sticks and they were poking and taunting at those sparrows and uh, the pastor stopped and he yelled out and spoke to the boys and he says how much for the sparrows and the little boys stopped and thought for a little while and a little twinkle came into their eyes and they said how much how much are you willing to pay and the pastor thought and he reached into his pocket and he pulled out a 50 euro note 50 euros didn't take the boys long to make up their mind they grabbed the 50 euros and, and just took off and the, the pastor was left with this makeshift cage and these sparrows and what did he do he opened the cage and released the birds amen now that's a, a beautiful picture of Christ's redemption of our lives amen we were trapped by sin by circumstances by situations that we had no power to break free from and Christ's hands have come and they've opened up the prison doors they've opened up the cage door and set us free amen it is for freedom that Christ has set us free praise his mighty name hallelujah and you know for many of us it's like you know there are purposes there are gifts there are things that God has placed dreams that God has placed within us and the enemy has caged us the enemy has imprisoned us amen and today I'm going to believe God is going to set some of those things free amen talking with somebody in the week in the during the week who has a tremendous ability in, uh, in communication and yet you know all through her life she's been told she wasn't good enough and not to keep quiet not to speak up not to share what was on her heart and that produced stuttering it produced embarrassment it produced all kinds of things and, you know we prayed this week and God gloriously set her free amen and is continuing to do that amen and God's word came God has not given you a spirit of fear but love power and sound mind amen you see that scripture relates to young Timothy Timothy a young man who again had tremendous potential dreams galore potential galore but what had happened was a spirit of fear had just bound him up and restricted him and Paul encouraged him stir up that gift that's within you stir up those dreams because God has not given you a spirit of fear that spirit of fear does not come from God it comes from the enemy but what God has given you he's given you a spirit of power of love and soundness of mind amen and when we begin to engage and operate in God's strength, His grace, when we kick in and engage with that, hallelujah, bars can't hold us, people's opinions can't hold us, our past can't hold us, we are free, free indeed, amen. The love of God comes, fear vanishes like when you turn on a light in a dark room, hallelujah. Perfect love casts out fear, the perfect love of God will destroy the cage of fear, amen, and torment and panic. Praise God. And God's given you a mind, hallelujah, an ability to be disciplined in your thinking and to speak what God would have you to share. Praise God, hallelujah. So there's, I want to change tracks here and just look here, the fact, looking at, at traps. And the one thing you want to understand this morning is, is that there's something common about all traps. First thing is, is traps, what's common to traps, they're all based on deception. All traps are based on deception. See, when you're trying, when a predator is trying to capture a victim, what he does is he lures that victim into a place of weakness and vulnerability. By deceiving them the victim that he's safe and that no harm will come to them think about it 
You know, the enemy wants to uh, basically create uh, a deception that if you step there, you're going to be safe. Nothing's going to take, no, nothing, nothing's going to harm you. Amen. He's a con artist. The Bible says he's a liar. And to the extent that we believe his lies is often the extent that we become entrapped by his deception. Amen. That's why Jesus says you will know the truth. You will have a, an encounter with truth that will set you free. Jesus is, I am that encounter. I am the truth. Hallelujah. The way and the life. Praise God. So all traps are based on deception. The other point about traps is a trap is always stronger than its victim. Amen. A trap that is weaker than its victim is no trap. You just break out of it. So by nature, traps have to be more dominant, stronger than the victim. All traps are designed to restrict and rob the victim of freedom. I mean, that's he, the, 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 the trap the, the fowler wanted to restrict and rob that bird of its ability to fly. And secondly, and fourthly, all traps bring death and destruction to their victims. Amen. So in this passage, we're told that this is the, the snare of the fowlers, the bird catcher, bird trap. Amen. But there are different kinds of traps. And we're going to look at a few of those uh, today, the different types of traps. And it's going to be a bit of a, a, an illustrated sermon. Uh, I'm a bit restricted today because I, uh, I was, I we don't have the, the freedom of movement at the moment because of this COVID, but let's, uh, let's give it a go, okay? So the first trap I want to talk to you about is what I call the trap of trauma. The trap of trauma. And we touched a little bit on this last week. These are, are traps that, that come and they're designed to, to knock you, to, to stop you dead in your tracks, to knock the stuffing out of you, to discourage you, dissuade you from following Jesus, to want to cause you to give up. We talked last week about those fiery darts that come out of the blue. And, uh, you know, that those fiery darts, as we explained, it was taken from uh, the Roman uh, army strategy. They had this strategy uh, for their armies called the turtle. And what would happen is, is they would approach a, uh, uh, a besieged city or an opposing army, and then the opposing army would start firing arrows. And so what the Romans devised was this, this, this strategy of when that began to happen, they would just lift their shields over their heads and they would lock shields one next to the other, forming a tor uh, like, the, like a turtle shell, if you like. And of course, the, the, the arrows would just bounce off. But then the enemy soon copped on. And so what they did was is they took the arrow and they dipped that arrow in tar, set it alight, and then they would fire. And of course, the tar would, the, the arrow with, that was fiery, that was with tar on the end, would stick on the, the shield. And eventually the shield would get so hot that the soldiers, the Roman soldiers would drop their shields and then they were exposed. Then they were vulnerable. So that's the work of the enemy. The enemy sends fiery darts, things out of the blue that hit you in the middle of, cause you to want to give up. This could be maybe a trauma. It could be a tragedy, a sudden death. It could be a loss of job. It could be sickness, financial failure, a painful experience. We all know what that feels like. You're walking along, doing well, and all of a sudden it's like the, the rug gets pulled out from underneath you. And suddenly your faith is, is tested, amen? And that can be a trap. Okay, that can be a trap. And I, I think, you know, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about how the, dis the disciples must have been going through when Jesus was crucified. Their friend, their master, the man that they've spent three and a half years suddenly is taken from them and put on a cross, cruelly crucified. And, you know, they, this sent them into a tailspin. Fear, anxiety, all those things kicked in. And they were, 
for a momentary trap. Amen. But the promise here, of course, is he will deliver you from the trap of the fowler. God's at hand to deliver you from the trap of trauma. Amen. Uh, you know, in the scripture, the words fear not are mentioned 365 times. So friends, that's, there's 365 days in a year. 365 fear nots. Here's just two that I just picked out here. Isaiah 41 verse 10 says, Do not fear, I am with you. Do not be dismayed, I, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Praise God. Isaiah 43 verses 1 and 2 says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I've called you by name. God knows your name. He knows your address. He knows what you're going through. Hallelujah. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers, they shall not overflow you or overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Praise God. So he will spring the trap of trauma. Amen. Those sudden blows, those sudden unexpected situations that hit you. He is there to lift you up, to uphold you, to strengthen you, to help you. Amen. And he will see you through. Amen. So we have the trap of trauma. A second type of trap is what I call the trap of tranquility. Praise God. And if you see the slide there, you see that there is uh, two frogs in a, um, in a pot. Now, some of you may remember this or have heard about this. Now, I don't have a frog here. That's uh, one of our dog's uh, little toys. But just use a bit of imagination. But what, what, what actually happens is, is that, you know, in this trap, this is the, the trap of uh, tranquility. Okay. And uh, so what happens is, is that the frog is placed in a pot. Of boy of water and put on the stove and initially the frog is quite happy to swim around but what he doesn't realize is is that you know, the water is getting warmer and hotter and suddenly it becomes boiling and the frog there is thinking to himself it's getting quite hot here there's something I need to do there's something I should do about this. But the trap is, is he doesn't do it. He just stays there and does nothing. And what happens is his tranquility causes him to have his go goose cooked. Amen. Amen. He doesn't have enough sense to hop out. Uh, and so he ends up getting cooked for his inaction, his inactivity. And that can be for us for like this. This can be a trap. You know, most of us have heard and know what is right, what is wrong. We know what we should do. But sometimes we lack the willpower. Uh, we procrastinate. We put off today what we, for tomorrow, what we should do today. And uh, we fail to follow through on good intentions. And we've said that many a time, you know, I ought to, maybe this is you, this you know, I know the gospel's real. I know Jesus loves me. I know he died for me. I know that the Christian life is really the life for me. But you've heard that once, twice, three, four, five times. And still not taken that step. For others, the call of God is on your life. And you've said to yourself, well, I, I really need to pursue the call of God. And you, you've heard it once, twice, one year, two years, three years, four years. And, you know, before you know it, the opportunity is missed. Some people, you know, it's, I know I should be in fellowship. And you keep on putting it off and putting it off. Others, it's, you know, I should be, I ought to be praying more, or I ought to be reading my Bible more, or 
there's some issues that I need to address, to correct. There's some people I need to forgive. There's some situations I need to address. But our tranquility, our indifference allows that to slip by. Amen. The Bible says today is the day of your deliverance. Today is the day of your salvation. When God speaks to you, I want you to take out that on board. And I want you to make a decision today. Today, you're going to do it. Today, you're just going to stop procrastinating. Today, you're going to make your decision to do what you need to do. Amen. Praise His mighty name. Hallelujah. See, the frog is unaware of the danger he's in. Just He's lulled into complacency. And we read there in, in Luke chapter 12 and verse 16 to, two, to, to, uh, to 21, rather. Jesus, what it says, Jesus spoke to them a parable saying, The ground of a certain man yielded plentiful. And he thought to himself saying, What shall I do since I have, rooms, uh, have no room to store my crops? So he said to himself, I, just, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater and I will store all my crops and all my goods. And then, and I will say to my soul, so you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to them, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then those things, then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Hallelujah. You know, friends, there's, you have an opportunity in your lifetime to make a difference. Amen. And it's important that you apply the gifts, the talents, the opportunities God has given you and use them for his glory. Praise God. So we've seen there just the, the trap of trauma. This is the trap of tranquility. Now we want to look at the trap of the trend, the tra trap of the trend. And this represents things that creep, upon, creep up on you uh, without you really noticing. And um, I'm going to use a, uh, another illustration here now. Again, this is a, a beach ball, which doesn't belong to me. It belongs to Lisette. But if you imagine this to be a pumpkin, and um, one of the things, the traps that uh, Native American and Indians used to employ when they were um, trying to catch a duck. When they were trying to catch ducks, uh, initially their, their first uh, attempts at that was to creep up and then fire their arrows. But what they discovered was the ducks were awake to that and that wasn't particularly effective. And so they came up with this ingenious device of trap to catch ducks. And what they would do is, is they would take a pumpkin and they would come to a, a lake full of ducks, hundreds of ducks, and then they would throw the pumpkin in the lake. And of course, when the pumpkin landed in the lake, the, the ducks nearly all flew away. Okay, They were frightened and they sensed danger and they flew. And so what they would do, they would then retrieve that pumpkin, bring it back to the water's edge, and wait for the ducks to all come back, and they would all settle down, and then throw it in again. But this time, three quarters of the ducks flew off. And so they, they went and they uh, retrieved the, the pumpkin a second time, brought it back to the water's edge, threw it in a third time, and this time half the ducks flew off. And they kept on doing this until the ducks grew used to the pumpkin. And then what the Indians did was that they took the pumpkin, they hollowed it out, put it on their heads, and they would get into the water, and they would just float under the water with their bags, and they began to pull the ducks. And one, two, three. That was the, the most effective way of getting ducks. Amen. Praise God. An ingenious method of catching ducks. And as I said, this speaks to us of things that come upon us gradually. And, um, you know, maybe it's dropping moral standards. Things that you were once 
strong on. Suddenly it's just, you know, there's, you're not quite as firm about the, that today. Permissiveness. Maybe it's alcohol and, and addictions that are creeping up on you, you know, be careful. These things are like a slippery creek bed. The closer you get, the more likely you are to fall in, amen. Um, just while I was thinking about this, I was thinking about uh, David Wilkerson. And David Wilkerson uh, preached a message once called Monkey on Your Mind. And again, it's a similar kind of thought, the trap of the trend. And how it goes, I mean, it's taken from the drug world, which they talk about monkey on your back, speaking of drugs. But this is how it goes. This is how the parable goes. Man is walking along and suddenly he comes across a little monkey. And the monkey starts playing around and, you know, he thinks it's cute and funny and fun and that sort of thing. And so, he, but he can, continues on, but the monkey begins to follow him. And then the man decides, okay, uh, it comes across somebody selling peanuts. So he buys a packet of peanuts and the little monkey comes up, jumps up on his shoulder. And the man is walking along and he begins to feed the monkey. Begins to feed the monkey. Continues on, keeps feeding the monkey. Walks another few steps, feeds the monkey. Feeds the monkey, feeds the monkey. But what he doesn't realize is that monkey is actually no longer a little cute monkey on his shoulder. That monkey's growing. And that monkey is getting bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger and stronger. To the point where suddenly the monkey has the owner under its control. The owner is trapped by the monkey. Amen. And there are some activities, some thought processes, some behaviors, some attitudes are just like that. The more you feed it, in the early stages, it's small, it's little, it may be frivolous. But soon as you entertain it, as you allow it and you feed it, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger until you are addicted, until you are hooked, until you are trapped. Amen. And that's the trap of the trend. Praise God. The other trap we want to look at today is also to do with monkeys. And um, this is called the trap of the treasure. And what this trap does, it, it reveals the, the nature of the monkey. Now the monkey by nature is a grasping, greedy creature. And, um, you know, this I believe, as I understand, is, is, is a type of trap that they would use in, in Africa. And what they would do, they'd get a, a pot of some kind and they'd put some kind of fruit into that pot. It could be an apple, it could be something sweet. And what happens is the monkey is so focused on what's in the pot, so focused on uh, you know, the delight that's in the pot. Sin can be delightful, can't it? What it does is it grabs a hold of the banana. But suddenly, it can't get rid of the pot. The more it tries to shake the pot off, it can't get rid of the pot because it's grasping a hold of the monkey. Amen. And you know, your banana, what does that represent? It's an obsession. It could be money. It could be a career. It could be cleanliness. It could be a house. It could be a, a relationship, it could be sports, some kind of pleasure. And you know, you're holding on to that thing so tight, you know, that it's got you under its spell, under its control, amen? You see, for the monkey to be set free, he has to let go of the banana, amen? And there are certain things that we need to let go of in order to come into a place of freedom. Certain behaviors, certain even pleasures, things that we consider as important, yet in the scheme of things are not. Amen. Uh, you know, we think in the scripture of the, the good, the rich young ruler. And he came to Jesus and he had, you know, all this, he gives him his CV 
of all the good things that he's done, all the good, the good man that he is. And Jesus just looks to me and says, go and sell all you have and give it to the poor. Whew. Suddenly he's asking him to let go of the banana and he can't. And it says that young man went away sad. Amen. And no doubt Jesus was saddened by his behavior. Amen. Praise God. So the question I want to ask you today, is there something, someone, some situation that if God says to you, I want you to let it go. I want you to drop it. Amen. I want you to put it to bed. Is there something that you would have to say, no, God, I can't do that. No, I'm not willing to do that. Amen. The Bible says, he who holds on to his life will lose it. He who holds on to the banana will lose it. Will lose eternal life. Will lose the freedom that God has promised. Amen. But he who's willing to let it go will gain eternal life. Praise God. So the trap of tranquility, or trap of uh, trauma, the trap of tranquility, the trap of the trend, the trap, this is the trap of the treasure. The other trap we want to look at today is the trap of um, tradition. The trap of tradition. And uh, for some people, you know, uh, well, they're just unable to change. Amen. And some of this COVID-19 um, has really exposed for a lot of Christians how traditional, how religious they really are. And, um, you know, it's said that uh, uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same things the same way and expecting the same results. Everywhere the scripture speaks of the need to grow, to change, to move. We move from glory to glory, faith to faith, grace to grace. Jesus puts new wine, not in old wineskins, but in new wineskins. Amen. And right now we're on the cusp, I believe, of some, some new wine being poured into a new wineskin. The problem is most people don't want to change. They like the old. They prefer the old. And for some people, you know, attending a Zoom meeting is an anathema. They can't do it. Friend, you know, if you were on the Titanic and the boat was leaving, and you say to the captain, you know, I don't like the look of that boat. I don't like the color of that boat. For goodness sake, get in the boat. You need to be in the boat. And for some of you, you need to be on Zoom. You need to be in that Bible study. And don't tell me that it's, you don't like this and you don't like that. That's just nonsense. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. The trap of tradition. Doing the same things the same way and expecting the results said that a, a rut is a grave with the ends knocked out. Church culture and traditions can be like that. You're just doing the same thing without it having any function or meaning in your life. Amen. Praise God. And uh, an old African proverb that says, live chicks never prosper under a dead hen. Amen. Live chicks don't prosper. You know, there's a time to let go. There's a time to move on. Amen. Uh, I think Darren was speaking just a few weeks ago. There are some things that you need to leave behind in the old before you can move into the new. Praise God. God is doing new things. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise His name. You need to close the door on the old and move into the new. So the Afri African proverb is, live chicks don't do well under a dead hen. Amen. Under dead religion. Under dead tradition. Amen. Where faith isn't spontaneous or involved. The Western uh, Proverbs says don't flog dead horses. There are some things that no longer produce fruit. And friends, you know, that can be a trap. A trap of nostalgia, sentimentality, uh, absence of real faith to move into the new. Praise God. So here's the test of tradition. Okay. If you propose an alternative. Okay. So now, church, we're going to meet online. Now, church, we're going to have prayer meetings on Zoom. We're going to have Holy Spirit night on Zoom. 
what do you say? It'll never work. We've never done it that way before. We're fine without it. If those are your answers or something similar, chances are you are in the trap of tradition. Amen. Praise God. And the final trap I want to look at today is what I call the trap of the trivial. And that's uh, failing to make to maintain the main thing, the main thing. And um, again, we're just some scripture here. Matthew 23, verses 23 and 24. It says, um, Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your uh, mint and spice and dill and cumin, but you've neglected the important and more important matters of the law justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides. You strain the gnat and swallow the camel, the camel, praise God. You see, friends, we've got to be able to distinguish between the minor and the major, the important and the not so important, amen? And very often, issues that arrive and, and, and arise in life are often not the big things. They're not to do with, you know, your salvation, your eternal worth, and your eternal uh, purposes. Amen. They're little things, little nuisances, little annoyances. Amen. And uh, and they're just like, you know, we can just be like trying to strain the gnats. I've got a, 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 this is all full of, of rice. And I could try and spend the rest of the time here counting the grains of rice and waste away, while away on something that really is totally unimportant. And for some people, that's, that's how they live their lives. They're focused in on, on little things. Well, I don't like this, and I don't like that. Do, 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 do. You know, all these little things that really in the heels of the hunt don't matter a hill of beans. Amen. What's important? To love your Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. And to love your neighbor as you love yourself. What's important is your freedom. What's important is that you are experiencing God's life and that's, and that's the fullest. What's important is that you are loving God and loving others, serving God and serving others. These are the important things. Amen. So we're going to leave it there today. And I just want to just, just conclude here by just asking you to think, what is God saying to you today? Is there a trap of trauma? that has stopped you dead in your tracks, taken the rug from out from underneath you, caused you to go off on a tailspin, he's here as the deliverer. He's here as the lifter of your head. Hallelujah. The one who will rescue you from the pit. Has the trap of tranquility kept you from making decisions that you know are right? Has the trap of the trend seen you compromise your values and your convictions has the trap of tradition restricted you and restricted your faith? Has the trap of the trivial caused you to miss the important and get bogged down in the petty and the, the unimportant? Has the trap of the treasure caused materialism, obsessions to surpass the pursuit of God's kingdom in your life? I suppose the question you could ask yourself is, do you want to be free. Hallelujah. And today I want, to, I want to ask you just to commit that area of restriction, whatever it may be, whatever God has spoken to you, commit that area of restriction into his hands. Hallelujah. Let's do that right now. Hallelujah. We draw this to a close. It's God's Spirit has been speaking to you about your life, about your situation, about adjustments that you need to make in order to come into a place of freedom. Understand that the trap will deceive you. The trap is stronger than you. Amen. The trap will destroy you, destroy the life of God.
God has for you. But he comes today as the one who will set you free. And I just want you to, to commit your life, those situations before him. And I want to ask God just to come. God's hands just to break open, to break the snare, to break the patterns, to break the hold in the mighty name of Jesus. Come, Lord, today. Come as deliverer into homes and into lives and set people free, Lord. It is for freedom that you've set us free. God bless you this morning.